one of the things I I would like you to do for the listeners is, if you yes. don't mind, is to try and bring Socrates to life and to try and explain some of his day, because a lot of people who don't know him that well is a detached, wise statue figure in their mind. But I'm yeah. curious, you know, how did he live his day to day life, and what did he wear, and what did he eat, and you know, all of those things about him as a human. Yeah, he his day to day life. Actually, funnily enough, Xenophon tells us. His, so Xenophon is one of his students, who happens also to be a, a famous Athenian general. Um, so Socrates was a, a weird looking guy. Um, he the Greeks called him a topos, describe him as being a topos, which literally means out of place, like he was a misfit. So on the one hand, he's a misfit. On the other hand, he's the quintessential Athenian philosopher he kind of almost in a way kind of embodies the city of athens in a sense while at the same time seeming like a real misfit in that city and he his friends say he had eyes like a crab he had a face like a torpedo fish uh he walked like a pelican and you know they describe him like a satyr like a, one of these like goat like uh creatures like pan and uh, those are his friends, right? He was balding and pot-bellied. And the reason all that stuff's interesting is he grew up in a, a period where the human form, and particularly the male form, um, was uh, ide idealized. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the Greek art is obsessed with male physical perfection, like the athletic physique and stuff like that. So Socrates was this kind of, seen by some people as a kind of misshape and almost they would have seen him as and i'm deadly serious about this i think it's quite an important point about him in greek theater there's a kind of stock formula in the satirical plays where there's a kind of pretentious character usually someone who's more uh upper middle class or, or noble and then there's a kind of buffoon like a country bumpkin or whatever the uh is a sort of every man and punctures their conceit by you know asking them stupid questions and so on and these are stock characters in greek theater people would have definitely seen socrates in his, both in his physical appearance and in his behavior as resembling a buffoon in greek satirical uh theater i believe and so he was an odd kind of strange guy. He was both really attractive to people and kind of repellent to them at the same time. In the morning, he, if I remember rightly, in the morning he went to the gymnasia, according to Xenophon. So Athens had three major gymnasia. And a, a gymnasium in ancient Athens is kind of, I guess the best way to describe it would be it's a bit like what we would call recreational, uh, like a sports ground. Um, where there's running tracks, a big park where people are doing pancratian or like mixed, it would be like mixed martial arts and boxing and wrestling, running, maybe throwing javelin. But there's also libraries and shrines and people doing public speaking. They're kind of like on a soapbox or giving lectures. So there would be young men training for their military career and also doing dance. Like they had this military uh athletic dance that they would do so performing kind of doing ritualistic dance and exercise and so on and then there'll be older men talking about philosophy and politics and giving speeches basically while they wander through the walkways and the parks that's where that's where socrates would send spend his mornings so often surrounded by intellectuals but also a lot of adolescent boys doing boxing and stuff and very outdoors like walking around doing philosophy. Um, the gymnasia of Athens were the Lyceum, um, the Academy, which became famous later as the schools of Aristotle, with the location of the famous school of Aristotle and the school of Plato, and also uh, Kunosarges, which is associated with the Cynic school of philosophy to some extent, where poorer citizens would go and train. So that's what he did in the morning. And then if I remember rightly, in the afternoon, he would go to the Agora. So Socrates was also very well known for hanging around in the city centre of Athens, which would be a little bit like hanging around in a shopping mall today. So that's where all the market 
uh, stalls where there were shops and loads of public buildings as well. The Stoapoikale, the home of Stoicism, it's like a, a, a colonnade, um, was there. Um, it's beneath the Acropolis and kind of in the shadow of the Acropolis and the Parthenon Temple. And uh, ironically, the we as far as we we know, the court where he was placed on trial and the prison where he was kept pending his execution were both in located in the Agora where he would typically hang out every afternoon of his life. So he, he would have been hanging around just outside um, the walls of the prison. Um, and then later he would be on the other side of them, hearing, probably hearing the same voices that he heard every day, but this time on the other side of the wall, on the outside of the wall. And he hung around in shopkeepers. So I'll tell you a little bit of trivia about Socrates. It's kind of gold dust to historians when we have these textual sources that often are surprisingly questionable from the ancient world. So we, we get little anecdotes. We get people's enemies criticizing them. Uh, we get jokes about people and satirical plays about them. And so sometimes it's difficult to know how much of this stuff that we can take literally by the, by the very nature of it. So there's an anecdote that Socrates was friends with a shoemaker called Simon. And he would hang out in Simon's shoe shop and talk about philosophy and Simon wrote down everything he said and he was the first person allegedly to publish Socratic dialogues after Socrates died so there were many different followers of Socrates that published Socratic dialogues but today it's mainly the dialogues of Plato and Xenophon that survive like almost all apart from some fragments the rest of them are, are all lost but supposedly Simon the shoemaker was the first person to write these dialogues. And historians thought this is ironic. It's got to be satirical because Socrates is famous for going barefoot everywhere. So the idea that he sat in a shoemaker's shop all afternoon doing philosophy, and this guy's like, Socrates, when are you ever going to buy a pair of shoes? Like, none of your friends wear shoes either. Like, is he going to put me out of business? Seems like it's like a joke or something, right? Um, however, when the Greek, uh, the, the Greek government were um, digging up uh, the archaeological remains of the Agora, they found lots of shops and the ruins of them. And they, they found the ruins of a shop where there were nails that they believe are used for making shoes. And they also found something that's pretty common in archaeology in Greece. Um, a Greek terracotta wine cup is called a kelix, and at the base of it, people would scratch their name, so because it belonged to you, right? It's got you scratch your name, but maybe it gets mixed up with someone else's cup once you've had a few too many drinks or something like that. And they found that in this shoemaker shop, the base of a kelix, and it has the name Simon scratched on it, wow. right? Cool. How weird is that? So you would go from thinking this doesn't sound, this doesn't have the ring of truth about it, like it sounds like a satire. To think, imagine pulling that out of the ground and thinking, you'd immediately know. You'd be like, this is the guy that we're told Socrates was friends with, that was a shoemaker, right? So Socrates hung about in shops and he, um, you know, the, the famous anecdote is somebody said to him once, Socrates, you're kind of aloof from material possessions, you're always questioning materialism and stuff. And yet you spend all day hanging out, or you spend all afternoon hanging around in the Agora, which is this temple to consumerism, like it's where all the markets are and the kind of bustle of the, the city centre, you know, like hanging out in a shopping mall. Like how do you explain that? And Socrates said, I like to remind myself every day, I like to remind myself how many things there are of which I have no need. Like, which is typically kind of ironic of him, like everything he said. And the famous thing about Socrates as well is his, Plato has him saying that his friends are sometimes not sure whether he's joking or not. Um, but he's the sort of guy that I think in many cases is simultaneously joking and serious and deadly serious. Like, somehow it's often he, that's why he's so kind of complex. He often comes across as if he's being ironic and joking. And yet he's never joking. 
Like he's in some sense, he's always at the same time seems to be deadly serious about what he's saying. But it just sends somehow ends up being humorous. So that's what he'd do in the afternoon. And then in the evenings, supposedly he'd go and hang out in his friends' houses. And we see that in Plato's dialogues and stuff, that like he'll go around and, and have dinner at a friend's house. Sometimes in the houses of very wealthy, influential like I think I mean it would be odd today because this this is a guy that walks around with no shoes. And some people ridiculed him like he was a like he was like a dirty vagrant or something, you know. Um, but at the same time, it would be like him having dinner with a cabinet minister, you know, or like a, a, or more like you know, like with the prime minister or the president, you know. Uh, he was besties with Alcibiades, who at one point became almost like. Uh, he was the commander in chief of the Athenian military, and and kind of being almost regarded as as if he was about to become like an emperor of of Athens, um, and that that was one of Socrates' best friends. So he he had a very complex social life. He was also known for talking to a wide variety of people, Athenians, uh, men. But he spoke to, we're also told he spoke to several prostitutes, um, slaves, foreigners, people that were rich, poor, a dwarf, and perhaps most controversially of all, several women in an ancient Athenian society that was considered, you know, odd and, and controversial. Like to do philosophy with women was um would have been seen by many Athenians of the time to be perhaps more controversial than doing philosophy with slaves. Um and he uh you know he's uh he's unusual in that regard. Like the fact that he wanders about the street kind of doing philosophy with random people as well. He's a kind of opportunistic philosopher. Socrates that's part of his character. You know, he just bumps in. We, sometimes he's described just kind of bumping into people in the street. He's he's going somewhere. He's on his way somewhere. And he gets interrupted because he bumps into someone. And they say, hey, Socrates, come and speak to this guy. Like, And he'll end up in a, what becomes a famous, celebrated philosophical debate. And that's not the norm for most philosophers. Even in antiquity, they usually would hang out where the, with their students in their little school or whatever and, and do philosophy um, with their friends and other intellectuals, not just random people that they bump into in the street. 